This is Power Trading Radio. Live. Power Trading Radio. Live. Fueled by Online Trading Academy. For more information on the show, visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Now, here's your host, Merlin Rothfeld. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Power Trading Radio. Merlin Rothfeld with you for your final two episodes of Power Trading Radio for this week. We've got a special guest in the studio here today. We have Larry Jacobson joining us. Larry, welcome. Welcome. I know it's kind of a surprise, but it I'm, is I'm glad to be here. I just want to ask if you purposely made my chair lower. I did. I, <laughs> it's to inflate my ego. I actually, do you guys have a notice? Is that just so you can look down on me? Is that what Never, this is? No, like? not down. I just need to feel better about myself. So... <laughs> Uh, quick shout out before I go to our top seven markets, uh, Online Trading Academy's YouTube channel, Guy Aaron, Dana, Gizmo, hello, uh, you all had a great day out there, and of course, on our Power Trading Radio one, I see Ruben, says December 4th is his birthday, well, we'll have to send you a happy birthday shout out on the 4th, Ruben. Um, all right, let's uh, start off with our top seven markets, and then yeah. I will go into a conversation with Larry, because there's a lot of exciting stuff to talk about today. If you have questions for us, feel free to send those on in at powertrainingradio.com. Click the little button there that says Power Blast or join all the peeps on the YouTube channels on Power Training Radio or on the Training Academy's channel. Send in questions, converse with them, and uh, I'll get to all those questions as we go. All right, TJ, bring me up some charts here. Uh, we, we were looking at some of Larry's portfolio picks earlier on, but we'll have to uh, forego those for just a second. Let's bring up the chart of gold, which is your worst performer on the day. I know you're like, wait a minute, why isn't it Bitcoin? It's always Bitcoin. <laughs> nope, today we had gold down 0.58%, the slide of not very much. Uh, gold was $8.50. 1,455 is where you see it, and you know we've been talking about it over the past couple of weeks. How it seems to be, it was a kind of a bullish flag. Now it just feels like it's just it's past the flag point, and it's just uh, a drapery, right? It's a it's a <laughs> curtain. Um, we've got a target on that right around 1,400, which means that's about another $50 lower from here. It seems to be that's where it's headed, just slowly drifting there. But that made it your number seven on the day. Next we had Treasury yields. Here's your ZN futures contract, which is for the 10-year note. TJ, add the watermarks if you wouldn't mind. Since he takes them off after every show. 10-year uh, yield was down 0.56%, just 1.766 on the day. Not much noteworthy there uh, with regard to the candle structure. We'll make this a daily chart. So you guys can see a little bit better what happened. Uh, but just a little bit of a green candle out there today with regard to the price because obviously yields dropped by uh, over half a percentage point. All right, that was number six. Crude oil brings us into positive territory. So from here on out, it's all gains in green. One quarter of 1% up today for crude oil. At one point, it was actually decisively down, did not look very good, and all of a sudden uh, rallied back up, ended in positive territory, looking great. Crude oil closed at 57.91, making it, as I mentioned, your fifth place finisher. All right, fourth place, S&P 500, 3,131 is where we closed at. Uh, a great intraday move today. Of course, I talked about this last week. They were talking about, oh, we have some trade issues that may not happen. And I said, watch, by Friday, you'll get something that says, oh, the trade wars, uh, trade talk's going to go through. Everything's great. Well, it didn't happen Friday. It happened on a Monday. So here we have that big rally up in the S&P 500, 0.75% for the S&P. Uh, great day up over 23 points. And that's an all-time intraday high, all-time closing high, all-time high, period. But it wasn't as good as the NASDAQ. Here is your NQ. NASDAQ 100 futures also getting to that all-time high, all-time closing high, and a beautiful big green candle after a couple days of just indecisive sideways action. The composite was up 1.32%. 8,632 is where the NASDAQ composite closed. All right, that was your bronze medal. Silver medal goes to the Russell 2000. Here's your RTY futures on the day. Hallelujah. Now, it's funny because I, I talked about how this is really just giving up the flag pattern. It actually followed through today. This is kind of what happens when you have a bullish flag pattern, right? You have the big impulse move. It hesitates, consolidates, and all of a sudden rips to the upside. We had a monster move today in the Russell 2000 up 2.07%. 1,621 is where it closed at. That's a gain of 33 points on the day. So one heck of a move out there for the Russell. But that's not the best. Yeah, Bitcoin back in vogue. Well, let's not call it vogue, but at least you had 2.85%. $199 move to the upside today. Uh, of course, we know it's been beaten up so much because of what's going on in China and a lot of selling going on. Well, you know, it's not, it's not dead. It's just got crushed. Uh, we were actually talking about it looking for a stability point somewhere lower. I thought it might actually drift all the way down to 6,000. Uh, and again, 2.85% today. We, we hit 6,500 earlier this or late last night, but right now you're at 7,200. For Bitcoin, was your number one performer, and hopefully some of that put some green in your pocket. All right, let's go to uh, our guest today. For those of you who don't know my normal routines here at Online Trading Academy, I do a lot of content production, and I'm working on a lot of different asset classes, options, futures, forex, commodities, all kinds of different things. 
And one of the projects I'm working on right now, I'm hands-on with Larry Jacobson, Russ Allen, uh, have been redoing Proactive Investor. And, and the name's a little bit different. Yep. What, uh, walk us through the name change, why that is, and, and kind of what the uh, the major changes have been. Well, I think it's just been confusing. Obviously, we're teaching you to be a proactive investor, but really what we're naming the course, ready? Drum roll, please. Strategic investor. Okay. <laughs> well, the idea here is that we wanted to teach you how to be more strategic in your decision making. You're going to be investing as opposed to trading, which we're doing on the shorter term trades. But we're doing something a little bit different, Merlot. Okay. What we're doing here is we realized that there's so many different ways that we can approach this class because you have some people out there that are doing great. They have everything sure. they need. So if we can just break, can we just break this really down? Break it we're down. talking about retirement right now, or more specifically, wealth. Think of it as two different ways to approach this bucket. If you're somebody who has never really saved much before, you're kind of starting out, or you have been in the markets for a while, but not quite where you want to be, then you have to still be in kind of a growth phase. And okay. we saw a lot of people that maybe were close to having everything they needed in 2007, didn't do anything, followed bad advice, and wound up losing 50%. And we'll talk about that shortly. Okay. The second group of people, they have what they need right now. If they could retire tomorrow, they would. But the biggest fear that they don't focus on is how to do what's called income phase, which right. is, I want capital preservation. Tell me where I need to put my money, which has the least amount of risk. I can't afford to be in the markets right now because I can't take another hit if there's all of a sudden a market crash. So the good news with this course is it's been designed just for that, but a little bit differently. Some of us who want to trade what we call more variable growth, and really the way you'd be in a, in a growth market right now is you could be self-directing your own account. So I could be in an IRA right now or even a self-directed 401k. Or some of you are in a company plan, which is a true 401k provided by your company. Well, here's the problem. If you're in a self-directed account, you can do virtually anything because if you're self-directing it and there are no rules like a typical 401k would have, I could be in futures, I could do options, I could do stock, I could do a whole lot of different things in my own self-directed IRA. But when you're in a 401k, you're pretty much bound to whatever the policies and rules are based upon what your boss has decided to offer the, the financial institution to manage it. Right. And this is why it's pretty interesting. There's two things you'll never see in a company 401k. One, they'll never give you the opportunity to do index funds. And two, they'll never let you trade ETFs, exchange traded funds. Now, here's why. They couldn't charge you these fun fees every year yeah. if they were not coming up with something to justify their fees. So they come up with their products called mutual funds, which is very different from what they first did back in the 60s, where a lot of the mutual funds that John Bogle started for Vanguard were just saying, hey, here are the 500 stocks in the S&P. Let's just create a mutual fund that tracks the 500 stocks and just trade the index. And charge you a whole bunch of fees. But well, that's there you go. But at least you had an opportunity to not further what we call water down the product, well, a lot of these companies out there come up with their own version of mutual funds that are supposedly growth, that supposedly are very close to the 500, but they're really not. Right. And as a result, they're charging you a lot of fees. You're not performing at the level that, say, an index fund would do. And it's very fascinating that a little few years back, if you remember, Warren Buffett made a bet with the hedge funds. He said, I will for 10 years just trade the S&P 500. You can do all your fancy shenanigans. Winner takes all $1 million. Guess who won? Buffett. <laughs> Buffett. And he, all he did was put his money in the S&P 500. So this is a great opportunity and where this class is heading right now is that if you're somebody just interested in cash preservation, you don't want to sit and watch the markets day after day, you're not even that interested in even trading more aggressively anymore, but really just putting on a couple of things once or twice a year, then we've come up with what we figure to be a two-day class, the first two days of this class, which is focused really on three things. What is the rate of return that you currently need? And that's based on filling out an, a calculator that we provide our students, which allows you for the, maybe the first time in your life to know what you truly need based on what you need. From there, we're going to teach you some cash and steady income type related pro, uh, pro, uh, what am I thinking of? Pro, uh, Portfolios. Thank you. But, you know, the asset classes yeah. and strategies that would allow you to take on less risk, but more importantly, not have to be in the market every single day. You can put something on once a year and manage it that way. And then those of you who are in 401ks, the first two days are perfect. We go into how to manage better the 401k, but it's really a three-step process. 
What do you need? What rate of return should you be compounding on? Two, what is the appropriate allocation or portfolio to be in based on that rate of return? And how do we go about managing that portfolio to meet that rate of return? All right, you cover a lot of stuff in there. Yep. Um, so I, I didn't even know where to start with my my uh, <laughs> my line of inquiry. Bring it on, bro. <laughs> yeah, no, I just you, you went through so many stuff. So obviously, yeah. you guys with the. One of the major pieces, obviously, is conveying the information, but the methodology in which it's conveyed yep. um, is akin to much more of what we've seen in things like uh, core strategy, which is a very step-by-step -step approach. Yep. For those of you who've seen Trade Builder and Click and are using Trade Builder and Click, you know that's a direct translation from the content. And there are these very specific steps, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, that if you follow those, it doesn't mean you're going to have a winning trade by any means. No. But what it does is it, it reduces the probability of you making an error or forcing a trade or investment that may be incorrect. And a lot of the steps that are in Strategic Investor now are following that same basic path. It's saying, look, we, we know that all of us, um, and we've got Ruben, Ruben who's uh, in his 20s, I'll, I'll be nice, uh, and he's in, you know, he's in his 20s. We've got Ruben in his 20s, you've got myself in my 40s, um, uh, and you've got uh, Russ Allen, well, he's a little bit further Let's down the road. Let's use Roger Best. Let's use Roger Best. Grandpa. Who's in his 90s. Um, no, kidding. <laughs> Love you, Roger. But you have, all three of us are going to have different objectives for that capital, Obviously, our end goal is to have enough money or whatever that amount, uh, that goal of capital we've decided on. But how we get there is different. For example, uh, if you look at something like Ruben, there's components in that portfolio that Roger would probably not be using, or if he is, he's using very little because there's more risk involved. And, and because Ruben would have more time, that allocation needs to be tailored specifically. And, and I think what's important to understand is the vast majority of Americans, the reason why the 401k plan is not working or one of the reasons why it's not working, is people are taking on too much risk. They don't, know, you mentioned, we find out what that rate of return is to help you achieve that goal, right? Mm -hmm. to, so you yep. identify what you want to achieve, right? We all maybe went through college and said, I want to get a degree in this. Okay, great. That was defining a goal. You, you had a plan with your counselor on how to get there step by step. Yep. Where did you do that financially, right? When did anybody sit down with you and say, okay, what's your goal? Uh, I want to buy this new car. Okay, step by step, how are we going to do that? It's not just save money, it's save it, grow it, and figure out how we can get there as fast as possible. Yep. So SI does just that, it's saying let's establish goals. And for some of you, it might be retirement. For Ruben, uh, it might be to buy that new Tesla truck and coming out in 2020, which I did. I know you put a down payment on that, Ruben. I, I bet you you did. I'll bet right now Ruben <laughs> put a down payment on that one. Um, but you know, now you have a goal, right? 2021, you have $50,000 saved up. Great. If you only have $10,000 now, how are you going to get that to 50 by then? Okay, that's, that's an extremely aggressive rate of return. Um, but at least you have a starting point and we can plan out what that rate of return is. Most people's rate of return to achieve their goals is actually much lower than what they think but yet we take on too much risk, and when we do that, it can actually set you back if things go against you too much. Well, but keep in mind too, and this is the hardest thing for most people to understand, that's great and everything works perfect if you followed your plan to the letter from the time you started as a young adult. However, we have a lot of older Americans right now that weren't great at savings. Now, some are lucky, they have pensions, but what if you're an older American that's been told your whole lives, and commercials have said this, right? I'll even give you an example, Wonderful World of Disney. We used to watch this as kids on Sunday nights. Well, what was the commercial that always played during that TV show, do you remember? I didn't watch TV. Mutual of Omaha. Oh. And the Mutual Wait, of Omaha. is that where the guy flew around in a helicopter and shot animals? No. You're thinking of, <laughs> no, that's a whole different. <laughs> No, Mutual of Omaha was an Oh, that was, he was the sponsor of that show. Yes, it was the sponsor of the show. That's all I remember is the guy wasn't, shooting It animals. wasn't some guy shooting animals. The tranquilizer gun, and, Anyway, the, the bottom line here is the fact that they would come out and say, in your old age, you need, to be, you need to be conservative. Well, here's the problem. People take that as the Bible, where right. I get older, I have to be conservative. Here's the problem. If you get to be around 60 to 80 and you are not saving enough that you should be, then you have to be more aggressive. But right. here's what we don't understand. Aggressive to many people, because this has been kind of implanted in your brain from a young age, means risky. Well, I can be conservative and have risk, and I can be aggressive and have risk. All this means is if I need to be a little bit more aggressive, I've got to be a little bit deeper diversified and maybe have to be a little bit more in equities than I might like to be. But the only way I'll make that rate of return is by achieving what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So what people don't understand in one of the greatest moments, I took this course and I recommend it to anybody I basically talked to at the academy, is imagine not knowing 
It's like going to the doctor. Nobody loves going to the doctor. They're afraid of bad news. But isn't it better to know early that you're not quite where you need to be than waiting a while to find out, and maybe sometimes it's even too late? Yeah. So I get students that one of two reactions happen after that very first day of class. They either will go, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm nowhere near it, yeah. right? Or they hug you and go, oh, I'm exactly where I needed to be. This is amazing <laughs> news. But it's about finding this out. Right. And then once you know, then you start to understand that there's a way, if I could be conservative, to really be conservative and maybe you're too exposed to the stock market right now. You don't need to be. Or if you're somebody that needs to be a little more aggressive, then you need to understand how you're going to move that money at the same time what you will need to meet your retirement goals. You know, it's funny, in, in going through and working with Russ and Larry, there's a bunch of different strategies out there. And obviously, the goal is to, to grow your portfolio, right? We could just say, generically, say, to make money. The problem is, and we've talked about this on Power Training Radio a lot, is there are periods of market behavior that are not conducive to anybody who's bullish, right? Obviously, we know over time markets will go up, but there are periods where we might get a year or two or five years where it's just drifting down or not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, in that course, and we don't need to go into the details of it, but there's you've built in some stuff which I find very appealing, which is you can participate in some of the market gains, yep. but not exposed to any of the market risks. So if the market really starts to plummet, it's position, the portfolio is positioned in a way that you wouldn't be uh, sustaining big losses, you wouldn't sustain any losses really, if the markets drop. And I think a lot of people might look at that and say, well, well that'd, that'd be great, but if the market's at all time highs, who cares? That's exactly the point. We have a market that's very extended and it's looking great right now, right? All time yeah. highs again today. That won't continue forever. At a certain point, it might be prudent to look at this and go, you know what, I'm just gonna go defensive. And if the market does go up 10% from here, great. Maybe I'll be capped out at 5% of that gains. Oh, well, I'm still making something. But if it does collapse, I'm not exposing my portfolio to risk great options, great uh, strategies that I think most people are not using. Yeah, and again, it all comes down to your ability to commit or want to commit to doing this. We're very aware that there's some people that love to be very hands-on, and if you have the opportunity to self-direct your own trading, then this is a great class for you. But if you're some of it, like I said earlier, you just want to set it and forget it, not have to deal with it, then there are some strategies, Merlin, that they don't have to put on right. more than once a year and leave it alone and let it do its thing. Right. Uh, welcome uh, on Scamble. Yeah, we weren't, I wasn't sure where they're going to do a show today. We're going to do today. We'll also do tomorrow, and then we're going to take Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off. So thanks for joining us. Um, Harrison, it's a good question. It says, is it, is it a good idea to learn options before taking strategic investor? He's learning futures yeah, now. Yeah, not necessarily. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. I mean, ultimately, we use some basic option strategies in strategic investor, where in the options class, we're not doing anything related to stock or long term. It's more short term income. So it really is a great class class either way, but it's just a matter of where you want to start first. But it's not a requirement that you have to go through the options class to take the strategic investor first. You know, I think the, the important part there is options are certainly a, an important vehicle and should be part of everybody's strategic investor portfolio. However, the, the complex strategies, you know, those aren't necessarily going to be used. There are some very simple strategies to yep. use with options, so you don't have to have a great understanding of it, um, but uh, it, it's not going to hurt you. But I would say your first class should be strategic investor, period, or proactive. I mean, it's proactive yeah. investor now. The title will change here soon, simply because if we look at the, the target audience of, of Online Trading Academy and just people in general, most people probably don't want to be an active trader. I, I can't say as I blame them, right? They want to yeah. do their jobs, live their lives, and, and being stuck in the minutia of day-to-day -day market moves might seem like a bit much. But we all, well, I'm not going to say all, but the vast majority of everybody watching this now and listening to the iTunes podcast you all have some degree of retirement or investment holdings, whether that's through your yeah. employer, something self-directed, you know, pension funds, whatever, and you have the choice of where to allocate those, allocate those funds. It's just been such an archaic system that has been set up by the financial industry to make themselves rich. So if we look at our, number one is looking at our investments and saying, where are we? Number two is saying, what, is, what do I want to achieve? And number three is saying, now let me allocate my assets that I own and change how they're allocated to give me the best reward to risk ratio and help me achieve that rate of return that I need. Yeah, I think it just comes down to what your need is going to be. And a lot of times people don't know what they don't know. 
And what I love about this class, and you said it, it should be the first, one of the first classes taught in every high school. It's like you're because it's amazing to me how people have never learned this. And remember, when somebody came into your company many years ago and they said, all you need to do is this, 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 and this, you never saw that person again. Nobody called you in 2008 and said, go to cash. They told you just to completely buy and hold. Well, keep this in mind. This is the thing that nobody really focuses on, Merlin, is the fact that People have been doing exactly like they're told when it comes to the retirement planning, right? You put aside every two weeks out of your paycheck a certain percentage of your gross income that's tax deferred. It's not tax exempt, so be careful. It's deferred and as a result, it winds up happening is that you're putting this in and the last couple of years we've been putting it in at all time highs and a sideways market. Well, guess what happens when the correction hits? It's not the money that you paid in back in 2009 at the lowest prices. It's gonna be that money that you've been putting in week after week that you've been told to do over the last couple of years at all time highs that's gonna be the first to crash. This is why we see these devastating you know, reactions to the corrections in the markets going back to 2000 to 50%, 2007 to 58%. But one of the things I love about this class, it helps you determine how to time the market better. There's nobody who can predict what's going to happen, but imagine if you had some type of a strategy that told you when was probably a good time to start considering going to cash in your equities, that could have prevented a lot of chaos you know, in 2000 they, they, they and 2008. They built that into cars. They did. Yeah. On your tachometer, there's a little red spot. Even Castor even made commercials out of it saying, you but some cast room before your engine something d does something to get you heated up. I think that's what it was. And the engine just, you know, ends up exploding. Well, yeah, there are some things that might be redlining. And the cool part about yeah. it is, look, it, it, sitting idly opens you up to being subject to uh, riding out a major downfall. Either, yeah. uh, you can either protect yourself using these different asset classes, or you could even go inverse, which we probably wouldn't recommend for the longer term investors yep. uh, by doing some downside stuff. All right, uh, let's move on a little bit from this one because I want to make sure we get to some viewer questions out there. Um, I'm going to shift away from this question from Royce, which is a good one, but uh, Linda uh, just said this one, in, I think, last night. So, thank you, Linda. I think you're actually in the UK. She says, I joined OTA in February 2019. I've done core strategy and Forex with Louise Carr in St. Albans. So, awesome. you a great teacher there. I'm practicing hard trading, uh, sim trading, documenting all my trades, building a trading plan, and trying to work out my rules. My question is, when trades fail, which I'm okay with, as what he says, is a cost of business, I find it hard to understand where I've gone wrong or what I should have done differently, particularly if I think that I've scored that trade correctly. If you give me some advice about reviewing my trades, I would appreciate it. I would say first step with reviewing trades is go to the trade review sessions. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, it's interesting because I've talked about this before with students. A lot of students don't realize there's what kind of one of two ways you can play this. One, one of the things that I did many, many years ago is I joined the mastermind community for just this reason. I would go in and actually look at the supply and demand zone grids because one of the things that a lot of students want is that instant feedback. And so for me, when I would go in and take a look at the grid level levels that the instructors put on, I know they've already scored it and I would start to do something called pause then play. And what I would do is I would go in first, try to find my zones on that particular asset. Mm -hmm. I then would look at the mastermind grid levels and realize how far off I was. And then I would study those zones and I would basically go, okay, now I see where I went wrong. I really am not in that right area right now. Or what you could do is go back to the core strategy on demand. Make sure that you're setting these up correctly according to the rules. And then again, even if you score everything perfectly, we got to accept the fact that markets are going to do what they want to do. We're not going to win every single trade. But as long as you set things up correctly, you're fine. The problem I find, Merlin, is that everybody believes that any zone is a quality zone, sure. and that's really where they get in trouble. So if you have not taken the updated core class since March, Good suggestion would be to go in there and just kind of review the new rules we put together. We have things like move out, break out. We have a new way of looking at trend. That should give you a higher probability. And just keep at it. You know, it takes some time, but ask yourself what potentially went wrong on this trade, and maybe it was a different zone. So I'd actually look and see where price stopped and reversed. Study that and study what that zone looked like compared to the zone you might have put on. You know, there's a lot of factors out there, uh, Linda. It's not, a, it's not just so black or white that it was this or that. Um, there is a plethora of things it could be. And I'll, I'll run through some of those that I've had to learn the hard way through my experience. Number one was my, my stops, right? I may have had an inappropriate stop amount. Of course, if you're an online training academy graduate, you know the tools and resources to look at um, how much something moves on whatever time frame it is that you're trading 
and then add a, a an amount to that or adjust it to fit that specific trade. So that's that's the first one a lot of people suffer with is the stops are incorrectly placed, not just from a monetary value, but as Larry says, it might be the wrong demand or supply zone, right? Because not every turning point, and this is a problem, a lot of people yeah. look at a turning point and go, oh, that's a demand zone. No, it's not. Right. There are characteristics that make up a good demand zone and a garbage demand zone that you wouldn't want to touch. Right. Obviously, we don't go into the details of that here in the show. That's safe for the classroom. Right. But there are qualifiers that would make one way better than others normally, right? They don't always have to work, of course, but it's just the probability we're looking at. So you have your stop amount could be wrong. Also, the selection and placement of these stops could be incorrect. Yep. Another factor would be which direction are you going, right? We've been talking a lot on this show lately from the long-term perspective, you should just be going long. We're in uncharted territories. We're at all-time highs. Market pullbacks are great buying opportunities in a situation like that. Why? Because the trend is your friend. That said, we still need to use a lot of the analysis tools that you're using in the class and say, okay, where am I buying into this uptrend, right? If, if the market of security you're looking at moved 30 points and it's fallen 50 cents and you oh, that's a pullback, I'm buying in, you're still essentially buying the all-time high. Right. You know? So Absolutely. it's not a good thing to do. You have to find out where is a logical point for this to come back, a breather, if you will. Um, and that's, again, going to be using a lot of the core strategy principles of where it's located within the relationship to the big move. Uh, that's another one. So uh, another factor would be, are you being emotional? Are you responding to news? I like to go back and look at the trades that I've made and say, okay, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? Obviously, if it's a winning trade, we think we did something right. But what could I do better? Right? Was I reacting to a piece of news? Um, that usually was a big killer for me. So those are some of the pieces I would do, Linda. Certainly get involved with a community. That's one thing Yal Shahar spent yep. a lot of resources on is to make sure that we have a, a community of traders out there so you can bounce your ideas off of them. I mean, you, know, you have this as a resource, but I'm not going to go as in-depth as they would in the XLT or the trade review sessions. That's true. I would agree. Uh, how often are those trade review sessions? I, they're constantly going on. If you go into your XLT, you're going to see these trade review sessions. They're listed in the calendar. Mm -hmm. Also, go back and look at one that's in past sessions. So a lot of people are underutilizing XLTs. I don't know if that's you, Linda. You might be in them all the time. But here's my suggestion. I tell the students all the time, one hour a day. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't do two or three hours. Your brain can't retain that much. And break it down and look at those trades, like you said, Merlin, which worked, which didn't, and do we want to go forward or not? Uh, Ruben, you're right. Too many people have too tight a stops because of improper position size. So that's another piece to it is position sizing, you know, and, and Linda, this may be part of where you're falling into. You have such a large, maybe you have such a large position and you're looking at the amount of your stop loss and say, okay, I've got a thousand shares and I have a 10 cent stop loss. Great. I'm risking myself a hundred dollars. Well, maybe what you need to do is you need to trade 500 shares and have a 20 cent stop loss. Now your odds of getting stopped out are less, right? Because you're giving a little more wiggle room and you're not having as much share exposure. So there's a combination of all those factors. Like I say, it's not just one thing. There's, no. there's this, uh, an arsenal of things it could be. And that's the tricky part, is if you're brand new to this, which it sounds like you are, you need to be utilizing this, the network resources to help yeah. you identify things. Because trying to fix it on your own can be rather challenging. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a bunch of great traders on the trading floor back in the late 90s, and they all kind of helped me through it. Yeah, I would agree. All right, uh, let's do this. Let's take a quick break since I realize we haven't taken one yet. When we come back, I've got a question from Royce, which talks about just buying uh, high yield paying stocks. Sorry, I got tongue tied there for a second. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to send it on in. Larry Jacobson is here with me in studio today. You can send your questions in at powertradingradio.com by clicking that Power Blast button or join the guys over on our YouTube channels. That's Power Trading Radio as well as Online Trading Academy's YouTube page. We'll be right back after a short break. Learning this way is fine, when the stakes are low. But when the stakes are high, you need to rely on skill, not just knowledge. At Online Trading Academy, you build your skill one step at a time. We teach our students to trade and invest with a strategy, not a hunch. You learn our methodology, then practice it. You get to make mistakes and ask questions, and watch instructors make live trades. Develop your skill the right way. Click here to get started with Online Trading Academy. Meet Mac. As a trader, he liked the signals that came from technical analysis tools, but they didn't help him find the best trades consistently, so he searched for a new approach. Mac attended Online Trading Academy's free class and discovered their core strategy, a trading methodology that spots when big banks are likely buying and selling, so everyday investors can too. 
Mac carved out a path to trade and invest with confidence, and so can you. You've been listening to Power Trading Radio, live, fueled by Online Trading Academy. To learn more, visit us online at powertradingradio.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Power Trading Radio. It is your Monday edition. A little bit of a different show out there today. Less commercials and more Larry Jacobson, right? Oh, Can't go boy. wrong with that one. Well, I don't know about that. But All right, more commercials. <laughs> we'll be right back after commercial break. Um, <laughs> let's see. Roy sent this one in, and I think yeah. that it kind of, it's got, that's why I'm glad you came on today because yeah. it deals with a lot of proactive investing strategies sure. and uh, strategic investor. Roy says, why wouldn't you just buy a portfolio of stocks with high dividend yields? There are so many yielding over 10%. Okay, so, you know, we talk about that income aspect to your portfolio. We're finding ways that we can take very low risk uh, capital with our money and then generate some sort of uh, predetermined or at least anticipated income stream. Why bother? Why don't we just go and buy you know stocks that have 10% plus yields? Well, you can if that's in your plan, but understand that you'd have to own that stock, which means that are you prepared to pay X amount of money to buy that stock to generate that 10% dividend. Now, again, this to me is very similar to something we teach in the, in the strategic investor class called preferred dividend strategy, mm -hmm. but that's more of a hybrid. A, div, a preferred strategy has more to do with, well, I want to own stock, but it's acting more like a bond where I'm trying to preserve the capital and I'm making a dividend, but that's the intended goal. So the reason why I necessarily wouldn't put that into the portfolio is, if we're making 10% on the yield, and you're right, I can't generate any other type of rate of return at all, then even using leveraged asset classes, then that might be the strategy. Again, it's somebody who just wants very little maintenance, not having to get in and trade, then they can do a set it and forget it. They know they're locking in 10% in dividends a quarter, but again, are they shortchanging themselves where they could be making a much higher rate of return and making more money without necessarily having to own the stock and paying for that stock? So all those things have to be considered when putting on trades. Yeah, I, I have had this question many times over the years, and I think it's just a question of risk. I think what Larry was talking about earlier gives you a more predictable stream because you're looking at, okay, maybe the stock does pay you a 10% dividend. Problem is there is significant fluctuations with common stock. So if right. you're buying some, and, and part of the reason, you have to ask yourself, why would a company pay 10%? No, I know why. The only way that I would have to pay 10%, let, let me actually take a step back here. If I was going to loan you money, uh, you were going to loan me money, okay? And you know I'm worth it. You can check my bank accounts. I got, I've got great credit. I'm not going to pay a lot of interest to you because I'm one of the safest people that you're going to loan money to. So I might, you know, you get 2 or 3%. But if you look at my account, I got no money in there. I got car payments. You can see my bills are all racked up and things are not looking so good for me. I become high risk. And in that case, you're going to look at me and say, you know what? You're paying 10% or 15% because I just don't trust that you can make your financial obligations. Why would a company pay 10% to anybody if they don't need to? Companies will do that in, because of two reasons. Number one is they no longer have a way to have their share price appreciate because mm -hmm. they're not a growth stock anymore. They become a value play. So what happens is they entice people to buy the shares by giving them a dividend yield. The other one is they may be a company that is not doing so well and they're struggling. Therefore, they're going to try to attract investors by giving an attractive dividend. My concern is that people will believe this like Royce and say, I'm just going to build a portfolio with 10% dividend yield stocks. Well, yeah, you got your 10% for that year, but the stock price dropped 40%. Right. Remember, you have to own the stock to right. be able to participate. So a stock right now that probably has a pretty high yield would be GE. You know, Merlin and I have <laughs> talked about this stock many times on this show with GE. I don't know if you want to bring it over. Let's take a look. Uh, I'm just curious. GE, they, I, mean, I just love that their old slogan used to be, you bring good things to life. It's more like they're putting themselves to death. Well, you know, it was thick, I was really pondering this. And I, if I had to say there was a reason why I think it's GE... Really, their dividend actually is di not much. Well, you, you, so, want to sh you want to show... What, what, let's see, what is the dividend paying from a dividend yield, uh, though? Four cents of 0.35%. Is that, is that right, GE? No, nah, oh, yeah. go. it doesn't seem right. If you it go doesn't. down into statistics, it will say dividend yield, and it'll probably be better. I would look okay. under statistics. So I'm we can bring it over here so the viewers can see. Yeah, that. let's just take a look and see if there's a yield. And oh, of course, you. i got to pay more. Yeah, no, no, see. you don't. We can go down and see dividend yield. If it's not on here, it should be. Dividend yield, that's that's really low. Yeah. I'm surprised at that one. Yep, that is pretty low right now. So that means even with this discount, they're not paying out a ton. 
But usually like a utilities company, they tend to pay high yields because it's not a popular stock. It's a pretty much a sto slow and steady growth and they don't tend to fluctuate as much. And I think that's the key of what you were mentioning here. If I want to find a stock right now, I'm going to look for a stock that I don't expect to make a lot of money on the appreciation of price but I can hold this stock for long periods of time and they'll make it up to me in terms of the dividend being paid. So like you said, there's two ways that companies will pay there you. you. Here's one. Well, let's okay. go to the summary here and I will show you. Aberdeen. So here's one. Aberdeen, you got Aberdeen Income Credit Strategies Fund. Great. 13% yield. You're thinking that is, that's, that's pretty awesome. Well, right. I mean. It, let's it, go to the balance sheet. That's what you and I usually like to do. Well, let's I mean, so if you held this for a year, well, yeah. actually not too bad. A year, you're about break even. So you actually gained it. But there's been some pretty wild fluctuations. What do you want, balance sheet? Let's just take a look and see what this company's been doing under financials. And look, it's new. Ooh, wow. So if we go on no, they, here, they want to charge you for everything. Click now. on the balance sheet. You know how much I hate the income statement. So yeah, let's yeah, go to so balance sheet. And let's just take a look at this stock right now. Now, here's another pro thing. They haven't been around. Now, they totally switched it. Really? No, yeah. there used to be at least three years. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know how long this company's been around. Go to the bottom there. <laughs> not, not long. All right. They're not really making a whole lot in total shareholder equity. In fact, look at their prices. It's actually going down this year. Mm -hmm. See that? So they're not making as much as they made the year before. Oops. Let's look at cash flow. Bottom line is, right right there, it's basically saying with cash flow from operations. Net income's dropping. Yep. So look down at the very bottom. What's their free cash flow looking like? Oh, okay. Hold it's steady. Okay. But the bottom line here is that if this is not a stock that fluctuates, fluctuates, fluctuates. <laughs> <laughs> You can you know, do it. these days like you, I think I inherited your tongue twisting, <laughs> fluctuates much, then we can see a higher dividend yield. But again, is it a stock you want to buy into? Is it a company you believe in? And like Merlin says, if this company's plagued with a lot of fluctuation, then you're basically having to hold on to that to make more yield. Yeah, I, I just think that there's other ways to it. Certainly, we could add some that have a high dividend yield. And I think when you are looking to add something that's got a high dividend yield, a stock in particular, uh, you want to do a bit of research like Larry was talking about, yeah. looking at the fundamentals. And by the way, that's the perfect thing for you to look into with strategic investing. If that's basically your goal is that you'd like to be in things that pay a pretty steady dividend, then we teach that as part of strategic investing. Now it's called preferred stock, not common stock, but right. preferred stock uh, strategies right now where you can basically lock in a preferred dividend rate. Right. And not be subject to the price fluctuations. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, exactly. It's, again, it's knowing your asset classes. Yep. So uh, Royce, there you go. Hopefully answer that question. Uh, there are there's preferred stocks, which will actually give you the dividends without the individual stock risk. But if you'd like to know more, uh, you can uh, take Strategic Investor class. Nice plug for that one. Yep. You can find out more information about Strategic Investor. We're finishing up the slides right now, so probably available, I would say, probably February. Uh, I'll be rolling out. If you want to know more information, you can go and click that link that should be showing up in social media since I believe Joanne is with us today. She won't be with us tomorrow. So it will be no link tomorrow. If you want to find out more, click that link that's showing up in social media. That'll tell you which of our physical brick and mortar schools are nearest you. There are 50 of them. That's what I was trying to get out. Uh, each one has free classes, paid classes, community events, and just a lot of resources to help educate you on how these financial markets really work. Larry, are you, what are you doing this Thanksgiving? Going anywhere? Doing well, fun? no, we're staying home, but I'm torn, right? I'm torn between having uh, turducken okay. or the traditional Charlie Brown Christmas. You know, toast, gum <laughs> drops. Uh, jelly beans and popcorn. So, you know, it was up to me. You Sounds know a lot I, easier. Yeah, you know which one I easier. would pick. And you, what are you doing for, for Turkey I Day? I will be staying around home as well. So it's, it's a mellow Thanksgiving uh, yeah. for me. But but especially at the weather right now. I, I, I really hope. It's rain Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah, so. Well, no, I'm saying around the country, if you're flying, you're celebrating the holidays, please be safe, be yep. careful. A lot of mess they're expecting in, on the roads this year. Awesome. Well, Larry, thanks for coming on and joining us Thank today. Thank you, Marla. Uh, let's wrap it up. I was going to go right to a commercial. I said, you know what? Forget it. We'll go right to our economic <laughs> calendar for tomorrow, Tuesday, November 26th, the day before we have our last show. Uh, USD has CB Consumer Confidence and Goods Trade Balance, as well as the Richmond Manufacturing Index. British Pound has High Street Lending and the BRC Shop Price Index. Aussies with construction work done. And then New Zealand with the RBNZ Financial Stability Report, as well as Trade Balance. Earnings for Tuesday. Kind of quiet. Not a lot of, well, I guess there are a couple major ones in there. You've got Autodesk, Dude, you need a Dell. Dude, I love Dell. <laughs> uh, Bank of Nova Scotia, VMware, Analog Devices, Dell Technologies, Autodesk, HP, Dollar Tree, Hormel Foods, just to name a few. There are plenty more than that. And we are going, I believe we'll have John O'Donnell on the show tomorrow, and then that'll be our last one. For Hormel the Foods, spam. Yeah, It'll be a spamtastic They're doing impossible spam now. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, guys, that'll do it for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, until then, happy trading. We will see you tomorrow. Take care.